What does climate change mean for me? Not somebody else, not you, me. It's always about me. This is how most people approach climate change. How does it affect me? Which is not to say we are without compassion for starving people around the world where food security has been severely compromised by climate change. Closer to home, our hearts go out to those who have suffered from record wildfires on the West Coast or from intensified hurricanes on the Gulf Coast. We certainly would not wish rising sea levels upon anyone living along the East Coast. But compassion notwithstanding, up until the pandemic, we were burning more fossil fuel and emitting more greenhouse gases than ever. Not even our concern for our children and grandchildren and the warming world we are bequeathing to them has lessened our climate damaging behavior one bit. The only thing that would change our behavior is if climate change started affecting us. But here in Northeast Ohio, wildfires, hurricanes, and rising sea levels pose no threat. Temperatures here are trending upward to be sure, increasing certain risks like heat stress in its various forms or an increase in harmful algae blooms on Lake Erie, which is the source of drinking water in this area. Rising temperatures have also brought ticks into our area and Lyme disease with them. Our crop yields have been reduced lately because of wetter springs followed by drier summers, but the impact of these threats has been limited so far. Not at all like the raging wildfires or Cat 5 hurricanes we read about. However, climate change may be impacting us, even here, in a more significant way than we realize. James Hansen, an atmospheric scientist who has been dubbed the father of climate change awareness and who gave his own TED talk entitled why I must speak out on climate change, has said of climate forced migration. It is not difficult to imagine that conflicts arising from forced migrations and economic collapse might make the planet ungovernable, threatening the fabric of civilization. In other words, climate change is disproportionately impacting other people in other places rendering some of those places uninhabitable. People from those places have to migrate somewhere, like here. The threat of mass uncontrolled migration strikes fear into the heart of the heartland. Plenty of folks around these parts could be heard chanting, build the wall, not too very long ago. This is a relatively recent development. In 2000, there were only 17 border walls to be found in the entire world. Just 10 years later, there were 45, one of which is under construction along America's southern border. It is as if the people of the world are instinctively beginning to sense what climate scientists have been projecting for some time. Upwards of 200 million climate-driven migrants worldwide by 2050. Given that there are nearly 180 million people in Mexico and Central America, the prospects quickly become grim should a changing climate adversely affect food security in those disproportionately impacted regions. More on that in a moment. While it is true that the causes of migration are complex, it is surprising how often a changing climate is a contributing factor, if not the primary factor. We readily accept the climate connection for migrations of the distant past. Indeed, one of the early migrations of human beings onto the North and South American continents occurred because of an ice age. Then there was a mile high sheet of ice over where I am right now in Northeast Ohio. That buildup required a lot of water evaporating from the ocean and then falling as snow upon the land, compressing into ever growing ice sheets 
instead of flowing back into the oceans. As a result, the sea level was more than 300 feet lower than it is today, exposing a land bridge between the continent of Asia and the continent of North America. Over that land bridge, human beings migrated to this continent and beyond to the South American continent. Sometimes climate change has opened up areas to human habitation and flourishing, while other times it has rendered settled areas uninhabitable. Sometimes both scenarios occurred in the same place. For example, increased precipitation from regional climate change allowed migrating Paleo Indians to settle as agriculturalists in what is now called the Four Corners region of America's Southwest. There they transformed into the thriving Anasazi culture. But when drought conditions returned and the agricultural carrying capacity of the region declined, terrible conflict emerged among those competing for increasingly scarce resources. Ultimately, outmigration ensued, such as a dramatic abandonment of the complex of cl cliff dwellings at Mesa Verde. So we readily accept the connection between climate change and migration in the past. Why do we not make that connection with today's migrations? Maybe it has to do with the notion of human-caused climate change and a burden of guilt we prefer not to bear. But for whatever reason, we often account for today's migrations as an escape from poverty and violence. That is how the Syrian migration that began in 2011 was explained. There certainly was plenty of both poverty and violence, but why such critical poverty and violence at that time? What was not so widely reported is that Syria suffered its worst drought in 900 years from 2006 to 2010, one year before the first wave of Syrian migrants departed. Coincidence? Or were the Syrian caravans throughout the Middle East and Europe made up of climate-driven migrants? Here is a picture of those migrants heading across Europe. It is from a very commonly distributed poster promoting the Brexit vote. The number one reason given for the United Kingdom to leave the European Union was to take back control of their open borders with all other EU countries. A strong case can be made that without all those climate-driven migrants from Syria, there would not have been enough pressure for a Brexit referendum in the first place. So when the dots are connected, we find this butterfly effect, whereby a climate event affecting farmers in Syria ends up disrupting one of the world's great international alignments. It is for good reason that the U.S. military refers to climate change as a threat multiplier. When an unstable country like Syria is already teetering between civilization and an anarchy, all it takes is a climate event to tip it over the edge. That can then destabilize a larger region, which in turn reverberates far away. Indeed, the butterfly effect did not stop at Western Europe. Not only were United Kingdom eyes watching the Syrian migration with alarm, across the Atlantic, United States eyes were watching it with alarm as well. A year before the Brexit vote, 32 of 50 American states made it quite clear that they would not accept any Syrian refugees. No wonder that building a wall became such a compelling idea in America. It was compelling enough for the fellow leading the chant to become elected President of the United States. And it wasn't long into that new administration when caravans of several hundred thousand migrants began making their way from Central America through Mexico and into the United States. True to form, the media from left-leaning CNN to right-leaning Fox News 
reported the cause for the migration as an escape from poverty and violence. What the news failed to mention is how the changing climate from Central America had been dramatically affecting agricultural yields and food security. Nearly every one of the world's countries is ranked by the Global Climate Risk Index for having been most affected by weather events for the years 1995 to 2014, the years leading right up to the beginning of the flow of migrants to America's southern border. From the drought-stricken dry corridor, as it is known, Guatemala was ranked 10th out of 184 countries for being most at risk. Nicaragua was ranked fourth, and Honduras was ranked number one. Coincidence? Or are we seeing climate-driven migrants from Central America as we saw from Syria? If we are, and if they represent the first migration from a place where the carrying capacity of the land is being severely reduced by climate change, then we need to consider better responses than what passes for walls along our border. We need to rethink cutting off all aid to Central American countries, as our president at the time did, which only aggravates the poverty and the violence that result from the desperate competition for ever scarcer resources. It takes a lot for most people to leave homes and fields where their families have resided for generations, their cultural traditions are honored, their language is spoken, and their support systems are well established. But the corollary is also true that it does not take much to keep people where they desire to remain. For example, instead of cutting off aid to countries in the dry corridor, we repurpose a fraction of the tens of billions of dollars spent each year militarizing our border patrol, building a 2,000 mile wall, and so mismanaging migrant families that we inhumanely and indefinitely separate young children from their parents. We reallocate a fraction of that annual expense to fund proven solutions that improve the climate resiliency of small-scale subsistence farmers so that they can remain in place. Some solutions, such as sustainable farming practices that use old crop residue as a mulch to preserve soil moisture, cost nothing beyond training programs. Other solutions, such as water harvesting systems and small-scale irrigation systems that efficiently direct water to the roots of plants, while requiring an initial investment, can pay dividends for years to come, not to mention creating jobs to produce, install, and maintain such systems. Further solutions include disease-resistant coffee varieties for the main cash crop of Central America currently being decimated by a heat-loving disease, disease called coffee rust. Similarly, drought-resistant varieties of staple crops such as corn and beans are available now. If you'll notice the graphic with the two stands of corn next to each other, one is a drought-resistant variety and the other is not. What a difference! And the same can be expected with beans and other staple crops. Finally, the promotion of crop diversification is an effective adaptation. Plants like dragon fruit cactus and sorghum simply need less water to grow. Together, the solutions offered here, along with many other equally cost-effective ones, can improve climate resiliency so that subsistence farmers and their families can stay in place rather than risk a perilous journey to an uncertain future. Climate-driven migration is already happening around our world, and destination countries like ours are understandably concerned. It is projected to increase dramatically in the coming decades. As Dr. Hansen warns, human civilization is at stake. That affects us all, regardless of where we live. 
Right now, we live in a politically polarized country. Conservatives tend to be alarmed by the migrant crisis while being dismissive of the climate crisis. Liberals tend to be alarmed by the climate crisis while being dismissive of the migrant crisis. Maybe this is a place where we can come together, arriving at solutions for the migrant crisis by acknowledging the impacts of the climate crisis. That would be less alarming and more agreeable for everyone. When it's always about me, civilization is in deep trouble. Only when it's about us, all of us, does the fabric of civilization hold together. Thank you for holding it together.